In 1856, Bishop Warren Snow was the Mormon Bishop of Manti, Utah. Although he already had multiple wives, he wanted to take a local young woman as another wife. The young woman was already engaged to Thomas Lewis, a Mormon who was 24 years old. Lewis had been arrested for assaulting and almost killing Manti resident John Price with a shovel, and also threatening to kill his brother-in-law Isaac Voorhees. Bishop Snow pressed the young woman saying it was the will of the Lord that she marry him. He also pressed Lewis to let her go so she could marry him instead. Both the young woman and her boyfriend refused. Bishop Snow later castrated the young man while he was on his way to prison in October 1856 as a punishment for disobedience, and so that the young woman would no longer want him. John D. Lee, another Mormon bishop, wrote in his final confessions before being executed for his role in the Utah Mountain Meadows Massacre. In Utah it has been the custom with the priesthood to make eunuchs of such men as were obnoxious to the leaders. This was done for a double purpose. First, it gave a perfect revenge, and next, it left the poor victim a living example to others of the dangers of disobeying counsel, and not living as ordered by the priesthood. In Utah it was the favorite revenge of old, worn-out members of the priesthood, who wanted young women sealed to them, and found that the girl preferred some handsome young man. The old priest generally got the girls, and many a young man was unsexed for refusing to give up his sweetheart at the request of an old and failing, but still sensual apostle or member of the priesthood. As an illustration I will refer to an instance that many a good saint knows to be true. Warren Snow was bishop of the church at Manti, St. Pete County, Utah. He had several wives, but there was a fair, buxom young woman in the town that Snow wanted for a wife. He made love to her with all his powers, went to parties where she was, visited her at her home, and proposed to make her his wife. She thanked him for the honor offered, but told him she was then engaged to a young man, a member of the church, and consequently could not marry the old priest. This was no sufficient reason to Snow. He told her it was the will of God that she should marry him, and she must do so that the young man could be got rid of, sent on a mission, or dealt with in some way, so as to release her from her engagement. That, in fact, a promise made to the young man was not binding, when she was informed that it was contrary to the wishes of the authorities. The girl continued obstinate. The teachers of the town visited her and advised her to marry Bishop Snow. Her parents, under the orders of the counselors of the bishop, also insisted that their daughter must marry the old man. She still refused. Then the authorities called on the young man and directed him to give up the young woman. This he steadfastly refused to do. He was promised church preferment, celestial rewards, and everything that could be thought of, all to no purpose. He remained true to his intended, and said he would die before he would surrender his intended wife to the embraces of another. This unusual resistance of authority by the young people made Snow more anxious than ever to capture the girl. The young man was ordered to go on a mission to some distant locality, so that the authorities would have no trouble in effecting their purpose of forcing the girl to marry as they desired. But the mission was refused by the still contrary and unfaithful young man. It was then determined that the rebellious young man must be forced by harsh treatment to respect the advice and orders of the priesthood. His fate was left to Bishop Snow for his decision. He decided that the young man should be castrated, Snow saying, When that is done, he will not be liable to want the girl badly and she will listen to reason when she knows that her lover is no longer a man. It was then decided to call a meeting of the people who lived true to counsel, which was to be held in the schoolhouse in Manti, at which place the young man should be present, and dealt with according to Snow's will. The meeting was called. The young man was there, and was again requested, ordered, and threatened, to get him to surrender the young woman to Snow. But true to his plighted troth, he refused to consent to give up the girl. The lights were then put out. An attack was made on the young man. He was severely beaten and then tied with his back down on a bench when Bishop Snow took a bowie knife and performed the operation in a most brutal manner, and then took the portion severed from his victim and hung it up in the schoolhouse on a nail so that it could be seen by all who visited the house afterwards. The party then left the young man weltering in his blood and in a lifeless condition. During the night he succeeded in releasing himself from his confinement and dragged himself to some haystacks where he lay until the next day when he was discovered by his friends. The young man regained his health, but has been an idiot or quiet lunatic ever since, and is well known by hundreds of both Mormons and Gentiles in Utah. After this outrage, old Bishop Snow took occasion to get up a meeting at the schoolhouse so as to get the people of Manti and the young woman that he wanted to marry to attend the meeting. When all had assembled, the old man talked to the people about their duty to the church and their duty to obey counsel and the dangers of refusal, and then publicly called attention to the mangled parts of the young man that had been severed from his person, and stated that the deed had been done to teach the people that the counsel of the priesthood must be obeyed. To make a long story short, I will say, the young woman was soon after forced into being sealed to Bishop Snow. Brigham Young, when he heard of this treatment of the young man, was very mad, but did nothing against Snow. He left him in charge as bishop at Manti, and ordered the matter to be hushed up. This is only one instance of many that I might give to show the danger of refusing to obey counsel in Utah.
A few weeks after the incident, Bishop Blackburn of Provo, Utah, said in a Sunday meeting, I want the people of Provo to understand that the boys in Provo can use the knife as well as the boys in St. Pete. Boys, get your knives ready. There is work for you. In May 1857, Bishop Warren Snow's counselor wrote that 24-year-old Thomas Lewis has now gone crazy after being inflicted by Bishop Snow. When informed of Snow's action, Young said, I feel to sustain him. Wilfred Woodruff, a counselor to Prophet Brigham Young and future prophet of the Mormon Church, wrote in his journal that Young supported the actions of Bishop Snow and Bishop Blackburn. He wrote, I then went into the president's office and spent the evening. Bishop Blackburn was present. The subject came up of some persons leaving Provo who had apostatized. Some thought that Bishop Blackburn and President Snow were to blame. Brother Joseph Young presented the thing to President Young. But when the circumstances were told, President Brigham Young sustained the brethren who presided at Provo. He said they had done right. When Elizabeth Jones, the mother of Lewis, wrote a letter to Brigham Young to ask the prophet if the castration of her son was right and righteous, as she had expected him to be taken to the Salt Lake Penitentiary for his crimes, Young responded, I would prefer that any child of mine should lose his life in atonement for his sins than lose eternal salvation, referring to the Mormon doctrine of blood atonement, which claimed that Christ's atonement does not apply to certain sins and that one must spill his own blood to be forgiven.